Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the George W. Norris Legislative Chamber for the 47th day of the 108th Legislature Second Session. Our chaplain for today is Senator Lowe. Please rise. Please attain an attitude of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we need you. We need you today and we need you every day. As we look at today's events and as they unfold before us, please be, be there with us, be there to guide us, to, to make us uh, stay silent if we need to be, to speak when called upon. Please look after the, the clerk's office and the pages that stand before us today as they go about our will and, and uh, try to keep us uh, mindful of the things we need to be doing. Please look after the speaker and after all the senators here today. Look after those that uh, help us around us today, the, the, the redcoats and the law enforcement. Look after those that come to speak to us and that are in the rotunda that have a message. Let's be mindful of everyone today. In your name, amen. I recognize Senator Lippincott for the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me in the pledge to our nation and its flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I call to order the 47th day of the 108th Legislative Second Session. Senators, please record your presence. Roll call.
Mr. Clark, please record. There's a quorum present, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Are there any corrections for the journal? No corrections, Mr. President. Are there any messages, reports, or announcements? I have none at this time, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Senator Aguilar for an announcement. Senator Aguilar for an announcement. Thank you, Mr. President. Since the incident that happened during floor debate on Monday evening, there have been numerous statements by both members of the public and members of the legislature that have painted an inaccurate picture of the legislature's response to the incident. 
In light of these inaccuracies, as chair of the executive board, I feel it is important to provide the body with as much of an update as I am to provide at this time. First and most importantly, the legislature has a written workplace harassment policy that dictates the procedures that must be followed in these cases. Among the provisions of the workplace harassment policy is the requirement that if a member of the legislature or other supervisory staff member has first-hand knowledge of a situation involving workplace harassment, is required to immediately report the situation to the chairperson of the executive board. On Monday evening, I was present in the chamber along with other members of the legislature and legislative staff during Florida date and witnessed Senator Holland's remarks firsthand. Pursuant to the workplace harassment policy, and because of my firsthand knowledge of the situation, first thing yesterday morning, I self-initiated a complaint under the policy and appointed a special personnel panel consisting of three members of the legislature to conduct an investigation. Under ordinary circumstances, the workplace harassment policy provides clear requirements that all allegations be kept in confidence pending appropriate action of the legislature under the policy. The policy also includes strong confidentiality protections for both the complainants and the accused parties. Because the event in question took place during floor debate and live on Nebraska public media, these confidentiality requirements have effectively been waived. The special personnel panel met yesterday to begin a formal investigation, and they will hire an outside investigator as authorized under the policy. This formal investigation will be thorough and by the book following the provisions that are clearly laid out in legislative policy. A upon completion of the investigation by the outside investigator, a written report will be submitted to the special personnel panel and the chairperson of the exec board. And the investigator's findings will be shared with Senator Holleran. Given the public nature of these events, I anticipate that the investigator will recommend that their findings be shared with a full body and made public. While the focus should be on ensuring that the investigation is done appropriately and out of the public eye, the lack of public comment from the executive board has led to some unfortunate assertions that this incident was being swept under the rug. This could not be further from the case. The legislature through the executive board takes all workplace harassment incidents and complaints seriously. And in this instance, my office acted immediately to begin the process outlined in the workplace harassment policy. I can assure members of this body, legislative staff, and all Nebraskans that any and all allegations of workplace harassment will be properly investigated and addressed as provided in the executive board policy. It is critically important that all members and staff of the legislature are aware of both their rights and the responsibilities under the legislature's workplace harassment policy. The legislature requires training on this policy each biennium and provides copies of the training on the policy to all new employees. Any senator or staff who feels that they have been subjected to workplace harassment have the absolute right to file a complaint under the policy with any member of the legislature. The counsel to the executive board, the ombudsman, the human resource director in the clerk's office, or any other supervisory employee in the legislature. These complaints will be taken seriously and handled confidentially as provided under the policy. More than anything, it is important that all members of the legislature and legislative staff feel safe in the workplace. And I urge 
any member and staff who have questions or concerns regarding this policy to reach out to my office. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Aguilar. Speaker Arts for announcement. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, just briefly this morning, one little agenda item uh, at 1130 this morning. Today is the annual former legislator day. And so we will have guests at 1130 this morning. And at that point, we will just have an opportunity to introduce them, greet them. And that will be at 1130. Another announcement. At the beginning of this session, I indicated in my memo addressing how I would be handling cloture this year that I would generally be following the 842 procedure. This year, unlike last year, I left myself flexibility to deviate from that standard. Going forward, I intend to implement a 421 cloture threshold for bills which are controversial and emotionally charged. I'm not referring to traditional governmental policy bills such as taxes or creating and funding new programs or existing programs. Although senators often feel strongly about these measures and the debate can be highly controversial, the debate time on the policy issues can lead to a better understanding of the bill and at times compromise. In my estimation, that is not the case with social issue bills such as LB441, which we are currently debating. Members generally go into debate with their minds made up and prolonged debate only serves the purpose of fanning the fires of, of contention. Generally not productive debate and it can be harmful to the institution. These have these social issue bills as I'm referring to. I want to give adequate time for debate, but once the facts have been presented and centers have decided how they will be voting, additional time does not provide value. I anticipate that there could be other such bills this session. I will determine which bills qualify, but will be very selective. Prior to beginning the debate on one of these bills, I will notify the body that the cloture time in that bill will be 421. Since this is a new policy, it obviously will not apply to the general file debate of LB441. We have approximately one hour, 20 minutes of general file debate before cloture will be in order, and we will follow that. Should this bill advance, however, this procedure will apply to future rounds of debate on LB441. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Speaker Arch. Mr. Clerk for items. Mr. President, turning to the agenda, general file, legislative bill 441. Introduced by Senator Albright, this bill for an act relating to crimes and offenses. Changes provisions relating to, to defenses for offenses involving obscene materials, harmonized provisions and repeals the original section. Bill was read for the first time on January 13th of last year and referred to the Judiciary Committee. That committee placed the bill on general file Mr. President, when the legislature left the bill, pending was the committee amendment, as well as a motion to bracket the bill from Senator Conrad, and a motion to reconsider the vote taken on the previous bracket motion from Senator Michaela Kavanaugh. Senator Albright for a one minute refresher. Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning, colleagues. Again, um, we don't have much time left, and I certainly um, want to take this time to apologize for bringing something that is hard for people to put their heads around. And I'm, I'm not feeling very good about the committee having to sit through as much as they did. I have the testimony on my desk but again, this bill is truly about obscenity in our schools, obscenity. That we're not going after um, teachers or librarians. If a librarian checks out a book, if she has a thousand books in her library and she checks out a book, there's no reason that they would be taking her to the principal and saying, this is horrible, how could she do this? Time. Thank you. Senator Wayne for a one minute refresher on AM 2789. Section 2810 is somewhat confusing to read and incorporates the defenses of 28-815, which requires a minor parent or guardian to be present in order to assert the defense. 
So what this does is try to allow, takes away that requirement and then allows um, obscene material to be prosecuted underneath uh, this statute. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Wayne. Senator Conrad, your record recognized for a one minute refresher and MO motion 1270. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. I uh, just wanted to remind the body that I had filed a bracket motion to structure the filibuster on this controversial measure, LB441. Friends, this isn't just some sort of gobbledygook kind of procedural issue. If you vote in favor of the bracket motion, if we secure a majority there, the bill is dead and we can move forward with the session, including the um, incredibly important measures that are on our agenda today and left in the remaining session instead of spending our time and energies targeting teachers and librarians. So I would urge your favorable consideration of the reconsideration motion. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Conrad. In the absence of uh, Senator Michaela Kavanaugh, we will return to the queue. Senator Hughes, you're recognized to speak. Ouch. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. First, Senator Lippincott, happy birthday. Just wanna throw that out there. I was, I was gonna give you my nothing bunt cake that we'd gotten from someone else, but I thought that wasn't very nice to re-gift. So anyway, uh, Mr. President, I rise today on LB441. I do not question the intent of this bill. I only question what it actually does. Senator Albright has stated that LB441 does not remove books from schools. So colleagues, what we're voting on is whether or not to allow librarians to be, school librarians to be criminally charged if a book, periodical, or other media in the library is deemed to be obscene. So books stay and librarians possibly go to jail. I spoke with some of our schools in District 24, and if a parent has concerns about a book, any book, it does not necessarily need to be obscene. If the parent of any student has a concern about a book in the library, they can contact the school. They tell the school they have a concern about their kid reading this book and the book is flagged by the school. The student cannot check that book out. Similarly, there is a book, if there's a book on the shelf that could be obscene, not age appropriate or has some other concern, we have a process where the book can be challenged. It goes before a committee, it is evaluated, and they can decide whether it remains on the shelf or not. If the committee agrees, the book is removed. If it stays on the shelf, the parent who raised the concern can have the school flag that book so their child cannot check it out. This seems to be a problem that has already been addressed. If you read LB441, it does not address the content of the materials in our school libraries. I want to protect our children. Our schools have processes in place to protect children from sensitive materials. During my time as a school board member, we reviewed and put policies in place to protect children and to provide a means for parents to parent their children when it comes to books, material, or materials or other things that might be outside what that parent values for religion or other reasons. However, the parent needs to be involved for this to work. For schools that might not have policies in place, LB441 does not solve the issue of content. It does not address the actual material on the shelves. If your school district does not have policies in place, then talk to your school board. And if they don't listen, then elect board members who will or run against them yourself. Making librarians possibly face charges because of a school district's lack of policies does not address this issue. And I urge my colleagues to consider what we're actually voting on here in LB441. And I would like to uh, give the remainder of my time to Senator Armaderas. Senator Armaderas, you yielded 210. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hughes, and thank you, Mr. President. After listening to this debate, talking to various um, other colleagues and giving careful consideration, I've decided the best way to support this particular issue is to provide complete transparency to parents, hopefully in the way of Senator Sanders' bill, LB71. While listening to the debate, I completely understand the want and the need to do something about what is available to Nebraska children in school libraries and in required reading assignments while they attend school. What I do know and what I have heard for quite some time now is what children 
should be allowed to read or not to read is quite subjective. Ultimately, for this issue, I support providing complete transparency to parents of every book available in each school library, as well as the comprehensive list of reading and writing assignments expected of each child each year and each semester. This is the best solution to provide parents the complete oversight of what they would like their child to read and write, and if they find it appropriate for their school age child and for their family's direction. This is a reasonable approach and should have no reasonable argument against it. I thank you again, Senator Hughes and Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Armadares and Senator Hughes. Senator John Cavanaugh, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. We're on day three of this conversation. And I do appreciate I was talking to Senator Lowe off the mic before we started today. And we were talking about I said, I, you know, we, Senator Lowe, I don't, it's no shock to anybody. Senator Lowe and I are on different sides of this issue. Um, but we get along and we uh, agree to disagree about this issue and get along about the stuff that we can work together on, like Rick House um, and other bills. And so we find common ground where we can, but we engage and I think attempt to engage in substantive a debate and conversation about the issues that we disagree about. And I, I really do appreciate that. And Senator Dover will tell you, and, and he'll have to explain it to you, but whatever my star sign is, he says he predicted it based off of my love of parsing words and what things mean and that kind of stuff. Um, the nitty gritty, the, the details and stuff like that. And I think you all can tell that. And so that's the approach I've taken to this bill and going through and talking about what the actual language in this bill is. I really do appreciate the comments of Senator uh, Hughes and Senator Armanderas uh, and bringing the perspective from Senator Hughes from her school district and what actually is happening in schools. Um, and I think that's really important that there are meritorious objectives by folks who want to protect children from being exposed to things that are age inappropriate for them. And of course, as a parent of 10 year old, eight year old, six year old, four year old, I am acutely aware of not wanting my kids to grow up too fast and to be forced into growing up through some sort of, uh, you know, exposure to something whether it's in media or in life in general. Uh, but what we're, this bill is not talking about those legitimate concerns. This bill is talking about exposing teachers and librarians, and again, to be the nitty gritty detail person, librarians in all libraries, not just, well, all libraries not associated with the post-secondary educational institution, but but not just school libraries. This applies to my Omaha Public Library, which you will all know I love. I'm a big fan. If I get an opportunity, I'll talk about it some more. But uh, so this bill potentially exposes those teachers and librarians to criminal penalties for having books that some people think are age inappropriate. Not books that meet the, the legal definition of obscene, we're talking about books that people think are just not appropriate for kids of a certain age. And Senator Hughes correctly pointed out there are processes in place outside of the criminal system to address this and make sure that kids are not getting books at the wrong age. My kids are in fourth grade is my oldest and second grade is the next one in grade school and they love the school library and they tell me that there is a section of the school library this school goes up to sixth grade there's a section of school library that they are not allowed to check books out of so this is a school that has a system in place to make sure that kids are only able to check out books based off of what's appropriate for their grade level they already have a system in place they've already addressed this Apologize off there. So my kids bring home, no joke, hundreds of books. Not a single one has been close to inappropriate from their school library. And we've had conversations about other books that they've expressed interest in that, again, not obscene, just maybe not age appropriate yet. And we've addressed that one on minute. a case by case basis. So I appreciate the sincere engagement on this debate. I appreciate the folks who have talked about what their concerns are. 
But this bill does not serve the objective, the stated objective, uh, and so I support the reconsider, I support the bracket, and I oppose the bill, and I encourage uh, your red vote when we do come to closure at whatever time it is later this morning. And I'll push my light in case we don't get there. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator John Cavanaugh. Senator Conrad, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. Um, again, I rise in support to LB441, weaponizing the criminal justice system by removing carefully crafted legal protections for teachers and librarians who love kids, who are excited to share with them the joys of research and reading, um, and dragging them into these manufactured culture wars is wrong. It's the wrong priority for our body. It is the wrong story to tell coming out of Nebraska, which now continues to have significant reverberations on the national level. I have heard from teachers and students and librarians in my district and across the state who are in disbelief that this is happening in our beloved Nebraska legislature. They don't understand why their government is using the power and privilege of their position to attack them. Think about that. They're having conversations with their children at their dinner table about whether or not they should resign. Their kids are upset that their moms and dads who go to school every day to teach and help kids research and learn are scared to go to work, don't know what the impacts of measures like this will be, and whether it passes or not, the chilling effect has already taken a hold. There are processes in place to deal with this. Weaponizing the criminal law to target teachers and librarians is ridiculous, and it is not the point of the criminal law, which is to advance our shared public safety goals. Let me be clear as well, while the speakers made an additional announcement to change the rules with 14 days left in the session, and we'll have to sort out what that means, people fighting against this bill for free speech, for academic freedom, for teachers, kids, and librarians did not bring this bill. We did not vote it out of committee. We did not vote against procedural motions to kill it. You're upset about this debate. You created it. <laughs> and now you're wringing your hands in fury and your brows because, wow, it got a little too hot. Wow, things went off the rails. Wow, it's taking too much time. That is manufactured by your own making. You knew what the result would be. What do you mean you won't let us criminalize teachers and librarians and ban books? Why is that shocking? Because it's shocking that you're trying to do that. We have workforce challenges. Nebraskans are crying out for targeted tax relief. We have beautiful stories to tell about who we are as Nebraskans. And you make a decision individually, the speakers made a decision individually to put this measure on the agenda for three days in a row and push forward no matter the cost to the institution or the state. The introducer will not step back gracefully. Each of you have decided to push forward to prove a point what? One that minute. you can utilize your political power to target teachers and librarians in the criminal justice system, and that's your top priority? That's where you want to spend eight hours of legislative debate? Because you can? All right. The exercise is on full display, as is your motives, and the historical record will be clear. I'm going to spend as much time as I can reading pleas from librarians, teachers, and kids in my district who are saddened, disappointed, frustrated, and scared 
that this legislature is using its time and its talent and its resources not to solve problems, but to try and criminalize teachers and kids in an attempt to ban books and ideas, which is anathema to the First Amendment, academic freedom, free expression, and taking care of in other processes. I urge you to Time. reconsider your actions and motives immediately. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Conrad. Senator Duncan, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning, colleagues. Um, I do, again, rise in favor of the motion to reconsider and in favor of the bracket motion and ultimately opposed to the underlying LB 441. Um, as was already stated, I do appreciate the conversations you've continued to have about this. Uh, I was also saying to some colleagues before we got started this morning that uh, I, I have appreciated the opportunity to have this conversation. And I, I know that sometimes I can get in the weeds about these things, so I apologize, but I really do enjoy talking about the law and the legal aspects. Um, I know sometimes from time to time it can seem like we're, we're being pedantic or we're maybe over articulating what we're talking about, but that's what we should be doing. When we're talking about <clears throat> laws or bills or proposals that modify criminal statutes, that, that remove defenses for certain targeted groups of individuals, I think it is worth a debate and worth a conversation to, to talk about what the outcomes could be and what the ultimate consequences can and will be for teachers and librarians and other individuals in the schools. Um, I received a voicemail last night on my phone uh, that accused me of being a bloviating attorney flapping my gums. And yeah, I'll, I'll admit, sometimes I, I am uh, want to flap my gums and talk a lot. But the reason I do that is because these things matter and these things are valuable to talk about. So colleagues, I would encourage you to continue to pay attention to debate. Clearly there are individuals in this room who have been listening um, and you know, on both sides who are engaging in this conversation and have changed their mind or stuck to their guns, but that's because people are paying attention and so these debates are, are valuable. And so I do wanna just encourage those at home paying attention to know that we're talking about these things because they matter and people are listening and I have colleagues right now who are looking at me and listening to what I say. So this isn't just to waste time it is to talk about the issues. So I just wanted to highlight that. Going back to the underlying bill of LB 441, I was thinking about this last night and I was kind of trying to simplify um, my, my arguments or, or, or get a little bit broader with regards to what the issues are here. And I think one of my big problems with LB 441 from a legal perspective in removing the affirmative defense is what it, what it ultimately does is it removes the opportunity for a teacher or a librarian to tell their side of the story. And what I mean by that is obviously in the court of law, you have the right to present evidence and you have the right to cross-examine and confront witnesses against you, but the burden is always on the state. The burden is always on the prosecution and in the vast majority of criminal defense cases to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you committed a crime. And your job on the defense side of things, if you are in fact not guilty of that, that offense, is to push back on their allegations. It's to present evidence that you're not guilty of those crimes. But if the prosecutor has tried to show, for example, here that obscene material was handed out by a teacher, and if for whatever reason they've decided that was obscene, what LB 441 does is it removes the opportunity for the teacher to then take matters into their own hands with this affirmative defense and say, okay, sure, maybe you find this obscene, but the reason I was doing it is I'm a teacher and I was acting within the purview of my job as a teacher or a librarian, or I was acting as a librarian for a city library, and what I was doing has value, and here's why. And so what LB 441 does is it removes that opportunity to push back on the, on the idea that what you're distributing is obscene. And I think that removing the chance to tell both sides of that story in that manner with that affirmative defense is problematic. And so that, that's, that's one of the issues I have with this. I also think it's noteworthy to say context matters. And when you read something out of context, it can seem more offensive than it actually is. And let me give you a good example of this. In court, oftentimes when somebody is accepting a plea offer. One minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The prosecutor will read into the record the factual basis. So they'll read into the record the probable cause affidavit or the police report. That often involves saying really, quote unquote, offensive things in a court of law. But the prosecutor doesn't get in trouble for that because they're reading it for a purpose and they're reading it to establish a factual basis. 
Similar to that, you can say or read offensive things in a book that you find offensive rather, but in the context of what you're reading, it can still have value. And so if I just got up and said the things that Senator Halloran had said on the mic out of nowhere during a debate about taxes, I might get in trouble for that differently than having a conversation about censorship. So the context always matters with which we talk about these things. And I think that's important to recognize when we're debating what the things are that are in school. So colleagues, please, I, I encourage you to continue listening. We're gonna continue this debate today. Uh, I think we've been having generally a good conversation and I would appreciate your uh, green vote on the motion to reconsider. Thank you, Mr. President. Time. Thank you, Senator Duncan. Senator Linehan, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. It's not even 10 a.m. and I'm already frustrated. First of all, I want to thank Senator Albright for all her efforts ever since she's been here. She has been a warrior on life issues. She's never picked up a priority bill that wasn't a hell of a fight, that other people didn't want to bother with, that she believed in. She yesterday, I was very busy with revenue yesterday, but I tried to help and she went around and tried to find somebody to work with her so she could get her priority bill in her last year to select file. Nobody wanted to help. So it's a little frustrating when I hear this morning how ridiculous she's been. She cares about kids. And you get up some of you, and talk about legal procedures and courts of law and affirmative defense. Nobody, I haven't heard any of you say that some of the stuff that was at the hearing, which I wasn't at, is okay and should be available to kids. One of you get up and say that. None of you have. And when nobody will go and help her try to fix the bill, because I thought, I mean, we all do that. None of us bring bills to the floor. Well, maybe some of you do. I'm, I never have brought a bill that was perfect and I didn't have to negotiate on and I didn't have to give a little. She does not deserve this treatment. She did not do anything wrong in this debate, guys. She is taking the hits for something that was completely out of her control. She can't even read it in private to me. She hands you a piece of paper and says, I can't, I can't read this. She is a soldier for all that is good, all that she believes in, and I share those beliefs. And I am very disappointed in the body that we couldn't find a way to help her with this. We'll have other chances, and I'm gonna hope that maybe somehow, before we leave here, that we do that. There is, some of you, several of you are brand new. You do not understand how close you get to your classmates when you're here. You, you wonder why I defend Senator Wayne or vote for his bills, maybe I don't agree with, because he's in my class and we've been through all kinds of battles together. And I've been, never has Senator Albright left my side, not once. Not once has she disappointed me, not once. She has voted in things for revenue. She's gonna, she's gonna do it today. She's gonna vote for things she doesn't like. A whole bunch of people are, because it's the right thing to do. So I hope, I agree with what Senator Arch said. We should not be wasting time. We have a lot of really good things we can get done, but this is a good thing too. So let's try and figure out a way that we're not talking about putting teachers in jails or putting librarians in jails. We're just talking about making sure that little kids, and I, up to sixth grade, I, I don't buy that. I've got a 13-year-old granddaughter. She, I don't want her reading this stuff. She's an eighth grader. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Linehan. Senator Merman, you're recognized to speak. Good morning, Nebraskans, and good morning, colleagues, and thank you, Mr. President. As I listen to debate this morning, I still stand in 100% support of LB 441, but surprisingly, 
this morning and last night, there is some opposition. Despite that opposition, nearly every member of the body here has agreed that we should indeed protect children from real and true obscenity. And there is some disagreement about what truly qualifies as obscenity and what legislation would be most prudent to go about it. Even if LB 441 does not succeed this morning, and I certainly hope it does succeed, I do have a few methods I would like to see, and I hope we would still have time to discuss on the floor this session. I want to point out three avenues we can take to protect children. One, we can age verify pornographic websites. Two, we can ensure strong parental review measures are in place. Three, we can ensure parents as well, parents are well informed of all content their children are receiving. Everyone here has said that it would be inappropriate and wrong with minors to be exposed to full-fledged pornography. Some have even made arguments along the lines, well, even if we control everything in the schools, our kids still have access to internet on their phones and will find worse pornographic content elsewhere. This argument is true and is why I have brought and prior prioritized LB 1092, the Online Age Verification Act. LB 1092 simply requires a reasonable age verification method to be put in place for porn websites. This is a common sense, court-tested approach that has passed on a bipartisan basis in about seven other states. If it, everyone here truly wants to protect all minors from pornography, whether they agree with LB 441 or not, I hope they will at least join me in supporting LB 1092. Other laws to protect our minors from adult content that I would like to see passed include requiring a parental book review process to ensure a parent is able to raise a concern with the local school board. The school board can then hear the parent out and then make a decision. Senator Walls mentioned something similar yesterday in the debate, and I think she's right. Some schools do, do a fantastic job with policies similar to this, but I would appreciate a practice guaranteed to all Nebraskans, which ensures this process, process be also maintains a level, while also maintaining a level, a level of local control. I would also like to see email notifications to parents with what books a student is checking out. This is for a few reasons. Firstly, firstly, we have heard many arguments yesterday by opponents claiming if there is a book which is inappropriate, a parent will ensure that my kid is or is not allowed to read it rather than passing a law saying which books are or are not okay. This argument is fair, but is based on the idea that a parent truly knows everything their child is reading, which is a big assumption. This process would also simply allow parents to make sure their kids do not One have minute. any overdue library books, so it has the benefits of both preserving parental involvement while also preserving school's local control of allowing librarians to curate their libraries with their best judgment. In conclusion, I support Senator Albright's 441, and I will be a yes vote. However, if you do not support 441, I still have outlined three different avenues of approach that I hope we can work out in protecting children. Protecting children needs to be our number one priority for our legislature, and I think every member here would agree with that statement. So let's get 441 passed, and among other things that I've presented, do what's best to protect all Nebraska's children. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Merman. Senator Hughes would like to recognize a guest underneath the South Balcony, Jeff Agater of Seward, Nebraska. Please rise and be recognized by your Nebraska State Legislature. Senator Lippincott, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, sir. 
What we've been talking about here is a change of morals in society, and I'd like to read a little uh, blurb here that I copied from a couple of years ago in 2019 from the General Society survey. It revealed that presently people consider themselves to have no religion, 23%. That increased 266% from 1991. It goes on to say that uh, back in the, night, in the 1800s, blasphemy in public was illegal. In the 1920s, booze and gambling were illegal. Now, of course, it's a major source of state income. Divorce now is at 50% after the free sex of the 1960s. Births outside of wedlock at 40%. Pornography used to go to prison, but now it dominates cable TV. And as I mentioned the other day, one out of five mobile searches is for pornography on your mobile devices, your telephones. Marijuana is the latest craze, and um, it just goes on and on from there. Many of you may re remember a, a lady by the name of Corey Tinboom. She was uh, author of a book called The Hiding Place back during World War II. Her and her family, they hid Jews escaping from persecution and death by the Germans. And uh, she and her family then ended up in a prison camp during World War, World War II. But she wrote, a, she wrote a book and she gave this little story when she was a young child. And I think it's appropriate to what we're talking about. She was seated next to her father on a train compartment, and she suddenly asked her father, what is sex sin? That means sexual sin. He turned to look at me, and as he always did when answering a question, but to my surprise, he said nothing. At last, he stood up and lifted his traveling case off the floor, and he set it on the floor. And he says, would you carry it off the train, Corey? I stood up and tugged at it. It was crammed with watches and some spare parts that he'd purchased that morning. It's too heavy, I said. Yes, he said, and it would be a pretty poor father who would ask his little girl to carry such a load. It's that same way, Corey, with knowledge. Some knowledge is too heavy for children. When you are older and stronger, you can bear it. For now, you must trust me to carry it for you. <laughs> My point in telling that story is that we want to guard our young people from things that are not healthy for them. For instance, here in this body, we've got a dress code. Guys come here with suits mostly, and guys or women are wearing their nice clothes. So we've got codes, dress codes. We have also have codes that dictate what can come in our ears. And we also have codes what can go in our eyes, things that we read. It's interesting to note that a year ago or so, we had people that dropped things off of the balcony. <laughs> Initially, I didn't know what they were, and I thought it could cause harm. And my initial response was I wanted to go over here and shield Senator Day from what could have been a potential harm from her. Why? Because it's just a natural reaction for a guy to want to protect a lady. And I think that in the same way that we, men want to protect women, adults, we want to protect children, and as lawmakers, I believe that we want to protect our fellow citizens. One minute. Sometimes I listen to the attorneys here in the chamber and things can get confusing. We've got U.S. laws concerning uh, constitutional, statutory, case law, public law, constitutional, administrative, criminal law, even mosaic laws, moral, civil, ceremonial. Some of these things can get confusing, but like Senator Lanahan just said a few moments ago, we just simply want to have areas in school where our kids go to school to have it be safe and wholesome. And we don't want there to be nasty stuff for them to read or be exposed to. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Senator Libengott. Senator Albright would like to recognize 69 fourth grade students from Cardinal Elementary School in South Sioux City. They are located in the North Balcony. Please rise and be recognized by your Nebraska State Legislature.
Senator Conrad would like to recognize 70 members of the Nebraska Library Association, Nebraska School Library Association. They are also rec seated in the North Balcony. Please rise and be recognized by your Nebraska State Legislature. Senator Blood, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. I stand in support of both the reconsideration and the underlying bracket motion. Fellow Senators, friends all, um, before I start, I, I have to address what Senator Lippincott just said. Senator Lippincott, it's just na natural for men to want to protect women. I don't even know what that's about, but I was there that day as well. And there's a picture of the chambers that day, and there was one person that was still sitting in their desk that did not run for cover, and that was me, because I knew the people that were in that balcony were not capable of doing anything except for trying to show their emotion and trying to show you how important the issue was to them. So the fact that everybody ran like chickens under the balcony, I don't know how manly that was that we want to talk about sexism and roles that we play, but most of the men ran under the balcony. They weren't throwing themselves on top of the women trying to protect them. So good for you for, I guess, trying to protect somebody who's probably the most capable woman physically in this body. I think she can pick you up off the ground and lift you over her head. So that was unknowingly, and I know not purposely offensive. So it's time that we use some more librarian voices in the body today before we vote on this. And I am reading a note that I received from a librarian about an hour ago. They want you to know that students are not forced or compelled to read books from the school library. Just as with any library, students get to pick and choose which books they would like to read. They also do not have to finish a book they check out from the library. Every time a class comes to the library to check out the books, this librarian tells them that should they not want to read it, that they can stop and return the book at any time. If a parent or guardian would like to opt their student out of reading certain books from the school library or to not have their student check out at all, that is fully within their rights. The parents already have the right to say they don't want their children to read that book. They just need to communicate it with the school librarian. And by the way, when I was in high school, when I read advanced books for my age level, I always had to get parental permission. That has not changed. If a class is reading a book that a parent or guardian would like to opt out their student out of, they can ask for an alternative book that is fully within their rights. They just need to communicate that with the, the, with the teacher. We were lucky that in every Nebraska, every accredited school is required to have a school librarian on staff, at least part-time. School librarians are certified teachers. They must carry a teaching certificate in the state of Nebraska. As part of their education, librarians are provided instruction on how to manage their collections, which includes both selection and deselection of materials. They do not add books to the collections willy-nilly. They do not just simply buy books off of best of lists, no matter who is providing the list. In no way, shape, or form do people keep books that they, that they have purchased just because it's on a list provided by any organization. I'm gonna scroll down because I think the thing that's most important and let's not forget that by and large, the vast majority of people did not choose to go into education to harm children. Quite the opposite. We endure long hours and low pay so that we can prepare our young Nebraskans to be thoughtful citizens. If criminal charges are filed, then the educator must foot the bill for legal representation while probably also being suspended without pay. It's a good thing we don't have a teacher shortage. It doesn't matter if the educator may not have to go to that, may not have to go to trial because they have a logical defense. The simple act of being cha charged could ruin someone's life. By the way, especially in a small town, folks. If there are other means to go after the very, very few true criminals who are providing obscene materials to minors, then this bill is wholly unnecessary. And that is indeed the case in Nebraska. If you thought it was difficult to fill teacher and school librarian positions before, I shudder to think what passing this bill will do to the future of schools in Nebraska, the educational future of our students, and the future of our communities. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Blood. Senator Halloran would like to recognize a guest underneath the South Balcony, Brooke Ritter of Kearney, Nebraska. Please rise and be recognized by your Nebraska State Legislature.
Senator Fredrickson, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning, Nebraskans. Um, I rise in opposition to LB 441 for many of the reasons that have already been articulated on the floor. Um, and I wanna just speak a little bit about some of the comments that have been made earlier today. And I, I want us to be really clear about emotional debate here in this chamber, because all of us in here were here last year, Obviously, we're here this year, and we need to be, we need to have a serious conversation about that. The emotional debate that has been referenced to by members of this body is not happening on budget bills. It's not happening on workforce licensure bills. It's not happening on agricultural bills. It's not happening on housing bills. It's not happening on tax policy bills. I said this yesterday, the Appropriations Committee and the Revenue Committee, they've been working so hard this year. And we're not seeing this emotional debate on those issues, which are arguably some of the most important bills we're gonna be seeing this year. The emotional debate that's being referred to is happening on culture war bills that are designed to divide, they're designed to create chaos, they're designed to whip up a base and not to pass good policy. Let's speak truth and be crystal clear about that. Crystal clear. The behavior that we've been seeing on the floor the last few days, that is a direct response to these bills being introduced, to these bills being prioritized, to these bills being kicked out of committees, and let's be clear, to these bills being scheduled on the floor. It's that simple. If we have concerns about preserving the decorum of the institution, speak with your colleagues. Clear pattern here when we're seeing the decorum get a little shaky. Very clear pattern. Not happening on revenue bills, not happening on appropriation bills, not happening on workforce bills, not happening on child care bills, happening on these chaos bills. We need to be serious. I'm gonna speak a little bit as well as, as a parent of a son who's in the public school system who brings home books. And for the record, I will also say he is in the public school system because he was at a private institution, but they were not able to meet his needs. And he was asked to go to the public school system. So let's be clear on other things we're talking about with schools. And I also wanna be clear about something else. We can disagree with each other and still be friends. One of the biggest issues with politics in our country today is this belief that you can't be friends with someone you disagree with. And just because you're friends with someone doesn't mean you need to vote for their stuff. I vote red on Conrad things, I vote red on Kavanaugh things, I vote red on DeBoer things, those are all friends of mine. That doesn't mean that they pass good policy. We need to be serious in here. And this, this is not serious. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Fredrickson. Senator Walsh, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> I'm a little uh, frustrated with <laughs> some of the comments that have been made and the rants. And I'm gonna just stand up and set the record straight because number one, to say that we, whoever we is, don't care is wrong. To say that we haven't gotten up to talk about protecting kids or keeping kids safe is not correct. We have gotten up plenty of times to talk about protecting kids and keeping kids safe. 
To say that no one has tried to talk to Senator Albright is not correct. I have talked to Senator Albright, and I've asked her about making sure that we also have policies and procedures in place to prevent this issue from even happening. I've talked to her two or three times. So to say that no one or we have not been part of this discussion is not telling the truth. I base my decisions on facts. I don't base my decisions on hearsay or whether or not someone works really hard on issues because we all work hard on our issues. Yesterday, I was told that 500 books were dropped off at OPS. Didn't know when, didn't know what happened, didn't know who dropped them off. But I was concerned enough to go out and make a call and find out about those 500 books. Because I do care about the kids. I do care about protecting kids. I do care about keeping kids safe. And the answer was, there were not 500 books that were delivered or dropped off to OPS that anybody knows about. So when we're standing up and talking about issues like this, let's at least tell the truth. I'm gonna take some time, like Senator Conrad had said before, and read some emails from people who do work in the schools, who have firsthand knowledge, who do actually care about kids and do wanna protect kids. The first one is this, and I may have to finish it on my second try. I've been a public school librarian for 16 years and been in the school library world for almost 20. 20 years, colleagues, 20 years of experience. How much experience have you had in the school public libraries? I have worked in both elementary and high school libraries. I have supervised school librarians in our largest district, which is now over 100 librarians, K through 12. I have taught for a school library graduate program for 13 years. I have served as a member, a committee chair, a board member at large, a president, a chapter delegate for the Nebraska School Librarians Association for over a decade. How many years have you guys done that? One minute. And now I serve our profession at the national level as well. While this is my story, it is not unique. We have fantastic librarians across the state, and I can say that with confidence. Colleagues, how many librarians have you taken the time to go back to your office, pick up the phone, and talk to them about this issue? I can also confidently say that school librarians are not the problem. Myths and disinformation, myths and disinformation are the problem. I have spent the last two evenings not with my family, but listening to the floor debate about LB441. And I've been seriously concerned about the amount of inaccuracies that have been shared by senators from Time. across the state. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Walt. Senator Hardin, you're recognized to speak. I rise in support of LB441. Obscenity is pretty serious. And there's a difference between causing dysfunction and revealing it. LB441 is revealing it. Sex and obscenity tend to work together in our culture. There are regions of the body where when another person touches there, we're no longer touching mere anatomy, but we're touching the soul. God designed it that way. It's powerful too powerful to be handled by kids. Kids handling Pepsi, no problem. Kids handling whiskey, big problem. 
Both are consumable liquids, but one, for kids, is poison. And so society has deemed that a liquid that's legally fine for adults is not legally fine for kids. That's inappropriate. Well, God knew that sexual issues would become powerful ones. And, you know, God likes sex. He invented it. And he invented this powerful thing for a powerful context. Culturally, we reject God's context for this powerful part of life. But unfortunately, we've decided that sex is not just for marriage. Sex is not just for a man and a woman. Sex is not just for adults. It's not just for the privacy of your bedroom. And it's really for every one of every age group. And so sex has been stripped of its context. And so we live in a world where obscenity hurts. And we want to protect our kids from that. I'd like to yield the rest of my time to Senator Wayne. Senator Wayne, you yielded 310. Colleagues, people ask why I voted, why I voted to that committee. Well, I'm looking for a compromise. Let me be clear right now. For all the people who are scared about teachers or librarians being charged, please listen to me right now. They can be charged right now. And the only time they can use, and this is Senator Dungan, please look at the law. The only time they can use a defense is if the parent is there. So every time in school they check out a book, a parent is not there. There is no defense for teachers right now under the current statute. I think that's bad. That is the current statute under 810. The only defenses are if a teacher or a librarian shows the material with a parent. So once they check out a book right now under current law, if a parent is not there, that defense is not available. So those who think teachers can't be charged right now, they can. And we are, I'm trying to look for a defense for the teachers, but nobody wants to talk. We're upset about something that was said on the floor. I didn't comment, let me just say this, I didn't comment because I'm a part of the six member committee and I wasn't sure if I was gonna be tapped to be a part of whatever could happen. So I haven't commented and I'm still not gonna comment. So people wanna know why I haven't commented, that's because I'm a part of a panel that could be invoked to investigate anything if something happens. So I'm not commenting on that issue. But I'm telling you right now, read the statutes. A teacher can be charged right now and their only defense is if they have a child with them. And the court has two weeks to determine whether or not that book or that object, in this case a book, is obscene. So I have an amendment. If we can get through general file, that actually probably will solve everybody's problems, but I can't get people to sit down and talk. The amendment is right now under current law, 28-816. I see Senator John Kavanaugh's looking that one up. Look that one up too. Because right now, a law enforcement officer can walk into any library. One minute. Determine it to be obscene file a motion in court for a judge to determine whether it's obscene or not. That is current statute. What I would like to do is change that to the DA and set up a process for a parent or a citizen to file a complaint with the DA. They go to court and get a declaratory judgment. What that means, colleagues who are not familiar with legal systems, it means the court will just determine whether it is obscene or not. They have a little mini trial. It has to happen within two weeks. After that, we can say the school, if it's found to be obscene or library, has to remove said material within 72 hours. And then and only then will a librarian or teacher be charged if they violate that judge's decision. That's actually offering protection that is not available right now for teachers or librarians. Read the statute. Time. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Hardin and Senator Wayne. Senator John Kavanaugh, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. I appreciate Senator Wayne's comments, engaging on the actual substance of what this bill does, as opposed to the feel-good language of, we need to protect children. I guess, expectation setting, Everyone here wants to protect children. Everybody cares about protecting children. The difference is, what is the approach? Senator Wayne is conflating 28808 and the defense of 28810 and 28813 and the defense of 28815. This bill addresses 28815. 
And though 28.8.10 does add an additional defense of 28.8.15, which means by association this affects 28.10, this bill, as currently written, affects the defense to a charge under 28.8.13. So that's what we've all been talking about. I know Senator Wayne has got his reasons in what he's saying, but everyone that's been talking about this also is saying, well, no one's been charged under this. So Senator Wayne, the argument that they could already do it, they're not, right? So that problem you just raised is not a legitimate concern as to whether or not we should pass this bill. The legitimate concern as to whether or not we should pass this bill is what this is really about, that any statement from this body about saying it's okay to take books out of schools and libraries will be taken as a permission to take books and, and out of schools and libraries. So it doesn't matter that, this, that the, this law is not currently being used, and it doesn't matter that this law, as written, would not be effective in actually serving the intentions that it, it states. It will be effective in serving the subtextual intention, which is, as I pointed out last night, Senator Mosier gets. It is the intentional chilling effect on librarians. Thank you for being here, I love you. Um, but it has the intentional chilling effect on librarians when somebody comes with a new stamp of approval from the state legislature and the government of state of Nebraska saying, yep, now we can go do this. We were stopped before, now we can do it because the legislature changed the law and allows us to. Though they are wrong, that will cause the problem, that will cause the pause in some of these folks up here that will think, maybe I should take out this book because these people are objecting to it. I was I had an affirmative defense protection before, and it had worked out before, but now these groups that are looking around for opportunities to take out books that they find objectionable that do not meet the legal definition of obscenity, they are going to see this. That's the statement that's made here today. So that's the problem. That's why this can't be fixed. That's why this bill is not something that we could go and nibble around the edges and say, well, let's find a little something for everybody here. Let's compromise. Let's make a change in a certain way. Let's move this word from an and to an or, and that'll fix everything. All that does, all that the real effect of that is, is showing that the state is okay with censorship. That the state is giving you the go ahead to go to your libraries and say, pull all these books. And again, those people are wrong on most of those instances. They will be wrong about that. But that does not mean it will not result in books being taken out of schools, out of libraries. We've already heard that we have systems in place from Senator Hughes, Senator Lo uh, uh, Walls, and others about actual things that actually solve One the problem. Minute. Thank you, Mr. President, that everybody's articulating. And it really is, the question is not one of obscenity. The question is, what is age appropriate? And we have systems for age appropriate determinations and making sure the kids are not reading books that are not appropriate for them. This is not a conversation about obscenity. And it is completely false to say that there is obscenity in schools. There are books you don't like and you want them out. And that is banning books and that is curtailing ideas because you don't like them. So that's what this bill would do in effect in any compromise or change or or amendment to it. So the idea is the thing that is the flaw here. The idea of banning books is wrong and the state should not endorse banning books. So I encourage your red vote on cloture when we get to it in a few minutes. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator John Kavanaugh. Senator Conrad, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, just for a, a reaffirmation of what resources are available to you, it happened to be, I guess, fortuitous, might be one way to look at it. I'm a glass half full kind of person. Um, but the National, the Nebraska Librarians Association Advocacy Day happens to coincide this year uh, with final debate on this measure. So we've had a chance to recognize those most impacted by this measure, those most concerned with this measure, and they're here. 
So if you have questions or concerns about what's happening in the libraries, go ask them. Go talk to them. Learn about the processes to put books on the shelves and remove content that may be objectionable, offensive, or inappropriate. And if you don't, avail yourself to that expertise and opportunity, your motives are clear, that this is a political stunt. Now let me talk about my friend Senator Wayne's comments, and Senator Wayne is such an incredible senator and a brilliant lawyer, and he is right that the statutes are messy. There is no question about that. However, colleagues, let me also remind you of this. We're twisting ourselves in knots to try and advance a political issue, not address a real issue. Prosecutors didn't come in saying, legislature, please fix this messy statute because people peddling obscene materials are getting away with it. Not on the record. Didn't come to the hearing, haven't engaged on this. Judges didn't come in, not on the record, not engaging in this, saying there's a problem with our criminal law statutes, we need your help to fix it. Attorney General didn't come in on this, didn't say there's a problem with our criminal justice systems, we need you to fix it. Cops didn't come in on this, not on the record, not engaged, saying there's a problem with this issue, we need you to fix our criminal justice statutes. Who came in? Primarily radical right-wing interest groups who have a right to petition their government as they see fit to advance a manufactured political issue to target teachers and librarians and call them pornographers and criminals, and it's wrong. And rather than saying to those loud voices, rather than saying that's not happening, these aren't real issues, and having the leadership to address real issues. You pander. You pander for the next election or the social media hit or whatever it is, and that's the opposite of leadership. Law enforcement is not crying out for these changes, and what Senator Wayne is trying to do to find compromise and consensus is not necessary because this is not a problem. And even though he is thinking creatively about utilization of declaratory judgment and otherwise, think about that as a remedy. We want the overcrowded court system to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down to books on the library shelf? That's what the proposal is for compromise? That is not what the court system is for in a modern and free society. It is 2024. This debate is divorced from reality. It is embarrassing to Nebraska, and we have bigger, important issues to address, like One delivering minute. for working families, finding tax relief, ensuring our schools have resources, spending eight hours twisting ourselves in knots over a manufactured political issue is beneath the dignity of this body. Thank you, Mr. President. I would yield the remainder of my time to Senator Dungan. Senator Duncan yield, yielded 40 seconds. It's a good 40 seconds. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm also up next in the queue, so I at least have a little extra time there. Um, colleagues, I want to talk a little bit about what Senator Wayne was discussing, and we're having a, a good conversation about that over here under the balcony uh, for those who are, who are at home. We're conflating two different things. And I, I do understand Senator Wayne's point, right? Senator Wayne's point is he's trying to make it better under one defense if you're charged under a certain statute. I'm going to clarify more of this later. But I don't think that we can make one defense better by limiting the defense in another statute that's available to somebody. So let me go back and kind of explain what the... Senator Duncan, you're now on your own time. Thank you. I was waiting for that part. Okay. So let me try to explain in simple terms what this debate is about with regards to the, it's already in the bill or it's not, or it's already in statute. There are two different statutes that somebody can be charged under with regard to obscene material. There's 28808, which I'm going to call 808, and that is giving obscene literature and material to a minor. That's one charge. There's another charge, which is 28813, which is the printing, manufacturing, producing, or generally giving obscene material in general. 
So one is giving to a minor, and one is the production, making, handing out, whatever, of obscene material in general. The, the language of the bill that is before us today modifies the defense to the general production, manufacturing, or distributing of obscene material, 815. The complicated part here, and this is where it gets very confusing, and I'm really sorry if I'm doing a bad job of explaining this. I'm just trying to make sure I'm being clear. We are modifying the defense to 813, not the defense to 808. What Senator Wayne is talking about with regard to parents being present and all these other things, that is the defense if somebody is charged under giving obscene materials to a minor. What this bill changes is the defense to the general production distributing of obscene material, which would be something that librarians or teachers could be charged with. So in the event that somebody is charged with giving obscene material to a kid, there are certain defenses that do incorporate part of what we're talking about here under 815. But if you're charged under 813, this bill would limit your options for a defense. LB441 limits your options for a defense if you are charged under 813, the general production of obscene materials or distributing of obscene materials. It gets really complicated. These are not simple bills. I understand that if you look at the bill, it's about a page long and it crosses out a couple of words. But in doing so, it implicates a number of statutes that have to do with a number of different things. This is hard. I'm sorry that we keep talking about the law. I'm sorry that we keep talking about confusing, convoluted things. I know it's annoying, but it's important because we're talking about charging teachers and we're talking about the potential chilling effect this will have on distributing information in libraries. This should be difficult. We should have a hard time understanding this because it is complicated. And I apologize if I'm getting a little bit frustrated, but this is frustrating to hear people say, well, why can't we all just get along and agree about this? It's, it's frustrating because this should be difficult. And I understand Senator Wayne's point. I understand that he's trying to increase the defenses available to somebody charged under 808. But I don't think we should do that at the expense of decreasing the defenses if you're charged under 813, and that's exactly what this does. Uh, attorneys disagree from time to time. You probably know that. Attorneys can debate things. We can read the law differently. But I can tell you that what 28815 does is provide an affirmative defense currently for a teacher or a librarian to say, I was doing my job. And if we remove that from the statute, I 100% agree with Senator John Kavanaugh that this is going to have a chilling effect. Do I think that more people are gonna end up in jail or in prison necessarily because of this? No, I, I genuinely don't, and that's what Senator Wayne said. They can currently be charged. I've made that same point too. But what's gonna happen if we continue this slow march into this quasi-puritanical idea that we should limit the things that our kids can see or read or One learn minute. about, thank you, Mr. President, is we are going to find ourselves having this chilling effect on what is available in libraries, on what is available to kids to learn about, on what teachers feel comfortable talking about in classrooms. And the last thing I want is librarians or teachers or anybody else to feel like they can't do their job to help kids learn. And I think we're all here believing that what we're doing is right. We're all trying to help kids. Nobody here is doing anything wrong. I want to once again applaud Senator Albright for, I think, doing a fantastic job on debating this bill and talking about it. She's been working very hard on it. I agree with that. But we just disagree. And I would encourage my colleagues to vote green on the reconsider and red on LB441. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Duncan and Senator Conrad. Senator Dover would like to recognize seven students, fourth to fifth grade students and three teachers in the North Balcony from St. Leonard School of Madison, Nebraska. Please stand and be recognized by your Nebraska State Legislature. Senator Day, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning, colleagues. Um, I think this is going to be my last opportunity to speak, and I think uh, my more knowledgeable about 
uh, the legal aspects of this bill, colleagues have uh, very aptly articulated the um, underlying legal implications of this bill. So I don't want to go further into that. Um, we have our librarians here today. It is their lobby day. And I felt like this was a good opportunity for me as, as I feel like I, I see some kindred spirits in the building uh, as a little bit of a book nerd to talk about my perspective um, on what reading and education and books and information can do for kids and how it's impacted my life. Um, I have my little kind of dorky Shakespeare and company tote that I carry around all of the time. My family visited Paris last year, and at the very top of my list was to go to Shakespeare and Company, which is a world-renowned bookstore, um, and spend as much time as I can, as I could, in this tiny little space, um, looking at books, going through them, deciding what I was going to buy, and then taking it home with me. And of course, I had to get a tote to signify my visit. Um, I remember when I was in middle school, I started to really get into reading longer novels. My aunt was a Stephen King fan, and so she started to give me some of her old Stephen King books. Um, and from there, I feel like my love of information and books and stories flourished. Um, still, as an adult, I have bookshelves at home that are overfilled to the point that now we have stacks of books that are on my floor halfway up my wall. Um, and for me, books are a really incredible way to find a an avenue to sort of get away from everyday life. Um, it's a great way to travel from your couch. It's a great way to find um, some relatability in characters in books. Um, it's a great way to say, oh my gosh, that happened to me, and to, to, to learn that you're not the only one that feels this way, that experiences these things. Um, I had a really great article from Columbia University that I was going to read but in true Nebraska legislature style, my laptop has decided to install an update right now, of course, in the five minutes that I'm on the mic. Um, I think I pulled it up here on my phone. Um, I do have to say before I finish, Senator Albright has been incredibly gracious throughout this entire debate, and I have to commend her for her ability to be measured on the mic and to stay calm amidst a very contentious issue, um, particularly when we had some unsavory things that happened on the floor. Um, her remarks this morning, I felt, um, were also very lovely. Um, to me, reading and information is a gift. These books, as I've mentioned multiple times, help cultivate empathy in human beings. They help to cultivate curiosity in our children. Especially when kids are given the gift of reading and the gift of information and the gift of curiosity, particularly in a home environment where they have a family that is available to discuss these issues with One them. One minute. As opposed to cultivating an environment of shame around certain subjects and topics. We have to understand that ultimately, this bill is about banning books. It's about not allowing our kids to read about topics that we find uncomfortable. And for many people in this room, topics that are uncomfortable usually fall into discussing LGBTQ people, issues around sexuality. Just because it makes you uncomfortable does not mean that it's bad. We have to work better to cultivate environments in our homes and in our schools where kids feel like they can come to the adults around them and discuss these things with them. If we continue to try to hide our kids away Time. from this type of information. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Day. Senator Albright, you're recognized to speak. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I know we're getting close to closure here. And for the librarians that are up in the balcony, I want you to know that this bill is certainly not focused on you or any teacher, only focused on those who would be presenting things to children that would be harmful to them. It's already spelled out in the law. And the obscenity is all around us, even in the public libraries today. But do we hear of librarians being charged? We don't. They check the books out. They can't know every single book in the library and what the content is. It would be for the, the Nebraska Department of Education, the State Board of Education, the school boards, the principals, how they run their schools. They need help. They're going to have to know what, what is right and what is wrong, but that we are not a, attacking anyone who is not intentionally doing this to harm the child. I know I've spoke for several hours, and Senator Wayne went to see his daughter play basketball last night, so I'm going to yield the rest of my time to him and implore you to vote green on 441. Thank you. Senator Wayne, you yielded 330. Thank you. And colleagues, I want people to listen to what Senator Duncan said. We're talking about two different statutes, and I'll be the first to admit that probably all four statutes need to be updated in some capacity. But if you've been in judiciary, we are just dealing with a lot and we are trying to deal with the best we can. And so at the end of the day, what he's talking about, well, actually, he actually agreed with me on the mic if you didn't hear that. But he did it in a way that you didn't know that he agreed, which is clever. Because what he's saying is if you charge under 808, there, there are no defenses except for the ones in 810, which means you have to have a garden or a parent or to be there. So we're talking about 808, in my opinion. I understand the original bill did not touch that, which was part of the confusion. And what our, my staff and, and the, the legal team were doing was going through trying to see how all these interplay. And it is complicated. But let me just remind you of two things. One, if they are charged, and what Senator John Cavanaugh and Senator Dungan are talking about are affirmative defenses. So in order to assert an affirmative defense, and this is what you can go ask John Cavanaugh about, Senator Cavanaugh, in order to assert an affirmative defense, you are saying, yes, I gave them obscene material, but I have a defense. Put that in perspective. They have to admit, yes, I gave them obscene material, but here goes my defense. But 813 only applies to adult-to-adult -to -adult situations. If a librarian or teacher is charged, what everybody keeps dancing around is they're charged under 808 because that is giving it to a minor. Why would the prosecutor charge a librarian under 813 when they're giving it to a minor? That's adult-to-adult. -adult. 808 is to a minor. So 808 applies. And what we are trying to do with the amendments is give them some defenses to 808. It's really that simple. The rest of this about chilling effect and all that, I understand that. But we do that every day down here. And in fact, we have a bill that Senator McKinney's bringing up about changing the OHA board, which will cause a chilling effect to get board members. So now are we going to be against that, Senator Kavanaugh, John Kavanaugh? No, he's going to support that bill. But that has a chilling effect on getting people to be on free boards. I understand this is a, a issue. I understand we're talking about removing books. I understand all that. I'm talking about giving defenses to librarian and, and a teachers. And if you don't think, and the argument is, well, people don't get charged today. Well, then if this bill passes, why would they start charging people tomorrow? You can't have it both ways. You can't say, well, yes, I know they can be charged today, which everybody will admit that under 808, they can be charged today. And then say, well, nobody's being charged. Well, then why would they be charged tomorrow? You, we just can't have it both ways, colleagues. Either we're afraid of them being charged, and if we are, then let's give them proper defenses to 808. And the only way we can do that is to get this through general file, come up with an amendment. And to say that we should, that's the committee, they should just wait, and if it comes to general file, it has to be ready for prime time. Let me tell you, there, every bill down here at some point gets an amendment, even if it's an E&R amendment. Every bill gets an E&R amendment because nothing is ready for prime time on general file. Time. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Decay would like to recognize 23 fourth grade students and four teachers from Plainview Elementary in Plainview, Nebraska, in the North Balcony. Please rise and be recognized by your Nebraska State Legislature. Mr. Clerk, do you have a motion on your desk? I do, Mr. President. Senator Albright would move to invoke cloture pursuant to Rule 7, Section 10 on LB441. Senator Albright, for what purpose do you rise? Call of the House and roll call regular order. There has been a request to place the House under call. The question is, shall the House go under call? All those in favor vote aye. All those opposed vote nay. Record, Mr. Clerk. 28 days, two nays, place House under call, Mr. President. The House is under call. Senators, please record your presence. Those unexcused senators outside the chamber, please return to the chamber and record your presence. All unauthorized personnel, please leave the floor. The House is under call. Senator McKinney, Senator Blood, Senator Dover, Senator Slama, Senator Iba, Senator Wayne just checked in. Uh, please return to the chamber and record your presence. The House is under call. Senator Slama, please return to the chamber. The House is under call. All unexcused senators are now present. There has been a request for a roll call vote to invoke closure. Mr. Clerk. Senator Aguilar, voting yes. Senator Albright, voting yes. Senator Arch, voting yes. Senator Armendariz. Voting yes, Senator Ballard. Voting yes, Senator Blood. No. Voting no, Senator Boston. Voting yes, Senator Bostar. Voting no, Senator Bostelman. Voting yes, Senator Brandt. Voting no, Senator Brewer. Voting yes, Senator John Cavanaugh. Voting no, Senator Michaela Cavanaugh. Voting no, Senator Clements. Voting yes, Senator Conrad. No. Voting no, Senator Day. No. Voting no, Senator DeBoer. Voting no, Senator Decay. Voting yes, Senator Dorn. Voting yes, Senator Dover. Voting yes, Senator Dungan. Voting no, Senator Erdman. Voting yes, Senator Fredrickson. Voting no, Senator Holleran. Voting yes, Senator Hansen. Voting yes, Senator Hardin. Voting yes, Senator Holcroft. Voting yes, Senator Hughes. Voting no, Senator Hunt. Senator Ibaugh. Voting yes, Senator Jacobson. Senator Kauf, voting yes, Senator Linehan, voting yes, Senator Lippincott, voting yes, Senator Lowe, voting yes, Senator McDonald, voting yes, Senator McKinney, voting no, Senator Meyer, voting yes, Senator Mosier, voting yes, Senator Merman, voting yes, Senator Raybold, voting no, Senator Reapy, voting no, Senator Sanders, voting yes, Senator Slama, voting yes, Senator Vargas, voting no, Senator Von Gillern, Voting yes, Senator Walls. No. Voting no, Senator Wayne. Yeah. Voting yes, Senator Wishart. No. Voting no. Vote is 30 A's, 17 A's, Mr. President, on the motion to invoke cloture. The motion for closure fails. I raise the call, Mr. Clerk, for next item. Thank you, Mr. President. A few items. Your Committee on Nebraska Retirement 
Systems, chaired by Senator McDonald, reports legislative, will, le legislative Bill 196 to general file with committee amendments. Additionally, new A bill, Legislative Bill 287A from Senator Brewer, it's a bill for an act relating to appropriations, appropriates funds to aid in the carrying out of the provisions of Legislative Bill 287 and declares an emergency. New LR, LR 334, introduced by Senator Raybould, that'll be referred to the Executive Board. Additionally, amendments should be printed from Senator Raybould to LB 1288 and two confirmation reports from the Transportation Telecommunications Committee concerning appointments to the Aeronautics Division and the Board of Public Roads Classification Standards. Mr. President, next item on the agenda, General File Legislative Bill 1306, introduced by the Education Committee. It's a bill for not relating to education. Changes provisions relating to fees for a certificate or permit issued by the Commissioner of Education, eliminates and changes funds, changes provides and eliminates powers and duties of the State Board of Education and the Commissioner of Education relating to standards of professional practices for teachers and administrators, investigations, and hearings relating to misconduct by certificate holders and the power to issue writs of subpoena or subpoena witnesses as part of an investigation of misconduct, eliminates obsolete provision, excuse me, eliminates provisions relating to the Professional Practice Commission, harmonized provisions, repeals the original section outright, repeals several sections in chapter 79. Bill's read for the first time on January 17th of this year and referred to the Education Committee. That committee placed the bill on general file. There is nothing pending on the bill, Mr. President. Senator Merman, you're recognized to open on LB 1306. Thank you, Mr. President. And thank you, Speaker Arch, for recognizing LB 1306 as a speaker priority. This bill, introduced by the members of the Education Committee, was brought to us by the Department of Education after the Department and Governor determined the Private Practices Commission to be a bit out of be a, a bit outdated commission. To explain the need for this bill, I will first go into the context of how the PPC currently works. Currently, when a teacher has an alleged violation of the standards of professional ethics and practices, a panel of 12 educators appointed by the governor and a hearing officer meet quarterly for a hearing. That commission then makes a recommendation to the Board of Education regarding the status of that teacher's certificate. The final decision is still with the Board of Education. The PPC just makes that recommendation. The problem with this system is that there is a huge backlog of teachers whose certificates have come under complaint, but are told to wait longer and longer. I have heard from PPC members that it can take nearly a year for the hearing to happen. During this time, that teacher may still be in the classroom. If that teacher did something deeply unprofessional or wrong, letting them stay in the classroom for almost a year and continuing to teach is just plain inappropriate. On the other hand, if a teacher didn't do anything wrong, we don't want them to have to wait for months and months not knowing the future of their career. This is the reason Groups such as the NSEA and Association of School Administrators came in and supported this bill. They want their educators to have the peace of mind, have that peace of mind. Under LB 1306, a teacher whose certificate has a complaint still has a hearing, but just with a hearing officer and not the full panel of teachers. The State Board of Education still gets the final say. By making this change, we're going to be able to greatly reduce the hearing backlog and give our educators the right to a speedy trial. I'll conclude by noting this bill was sponsored and voted out by every single member of the Education Committee, saves the state money, and has the support of the governor, the NSEA, the Department of Education, and Council of School Administrators. And by the way, I've uh, passed out a couple of handouts that uh, show what I just said. I've passed out these handouts explaining the need for this legislation that I would urge everyone to read. 
With that, I'll yield my time and ask for your green vote on LB 1306. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Merman. Seeing no one else in the queue, Senator Merman, you're recognized to close. Senator Merman waves. Colleagues, the question before the body is the uh, approval of LB 1306. All those in favor, vote aye. All those opposed, vote nay. Have you all voted that care to? Mr. Clark, record. 38 days, no nays on the motion to advance the bill, Mr. President. LB 1306 is advanced. Mr. Clark, next item. Mr. President, the next item for consideration is Legislative Bill 876. Legislation introduced by Senator Holcroft. It's a bill for an act relating to infants to amend Section 29.121 to adopt the Newborn Safe Haven Act to prohibit prosecution for persons complying with the Safe Haven Act and repeal the original section. The bill was introduced on January 3rd of this year, referred to the Committee on Judiciary, which reports the bill to general file with committee amendments attached. Senator Holcroft, you're recognized to open. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, uh, colleagues, and thank you for the opportunity to discuss LB 876, the Newborn Safe Haven Act. I would also like to thank Speaker Arch for de designating LB 876 as a speaker priority bill for this session and the members of the Judiciary Committee who voted this bill to general file. LB 876, the Newborn Safe Haven Act, simply increases the options for a desperate parent to surrender their newborn baby without fear of criminal prosecution. First of all, I would like to thank the 33 members of this body who have signed on to LB 876. In particular, I wish to thank Senator Michaela Cavanaugh and Senator Rita Sanders, who had similar bills but allowed me to take the lead. They were the first to sign as co-sponsors to this bill. This bill was advanced out of the Judiciary Committee on February 28th, with a vote of five in favor, two opposed, and one present not voting. There were no opposition testifiers during the hearing on February 7th. There were 154 proponents in the online comments for the bill, with only two out-of-state opponents. The Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services was among the two neutral testifiers. As most of you are aware, Nebraska's current safe haven legislation was initiated with the passage of LB 157 in 2008. Despite language in drafts of the bill specifying the age requirements for a surrendered child, the final bill was passed without such language. This led to children of all ages and even from other states being surrendered under the new law. A special session uh, with the sole purpose of providing a fix for the broad law was held later in 2008, and LB1 from that session added the words 30 days old or younger to the statute law. According to the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services, at least six babies 
under one year of age were abandoned in 2023 versus one baby surrendered under the current safe haven law. Since 2008, approximately 14 babies have been surrendered under the safe haven law and as many as 200 have been abandoned. I believe LB 876 directly addresses the disparity between these two numbers, these numbers, and should in theory reduce the number of abandonments to zero. Under the current law, only hospitals are approved drop-off locations. LB 876 expands the list of approved drop-off locations to include fire stations and law enforcement agencies that are staffed 24 hours per day, seven days per week, emergency medical service providers, and newborn safety devices. It also redefines newborn infant in state statute from 30 days old or younger to 90 days old or younger. The fiscal note for this bill is to provide funding for an ongoing awareness campaign for the Newborn Safety Haven Act by the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services. It will also fund a website to be maintained by the department that provides education and resources connected with the act. As mentioned in the bill, the website, among other things, shall also provide a method for a parent to reconsider the surrender of a newborn infant and allow an individual to undergo paternity testing for the purpose of determining the paternity of a surrendered child. Now I'm going to talk just a minute here about the newborn safety devices because that's where I think the opposition to this bill will come. So for the newborn safety devices, there is no mandate. There's no mandate or obligation in this bill for their purchase or installation by any approved drop-off location. And these safety devices uh, can only be installed at hospitals and fire stations that are manned 24 by 7. Those are the only two locations available for uh, the safety devices. The funding in the fiscal note for the devices is only for the installation of a receptacle once it has been purchased and a location established by the local community group. So it's really up to the community to decide if they want to have these devices and they will have to come up with the funding for them. I'm sure we'll talk more about that in a moment. Again, as you can see, LB 876 has been co-sponsored by a large and diverse number of senators from our body. I believe it is a direct answer to the question. We are asking women to bring their babies to term. Now, what are we doing to help them? The first handout that you were provided is the most recent information packet for safe haven baby boxes. And these are not the only option, but they appear to be the one that are most widely used. They are currently used in 14 states, and they've had uh, success, tremendous success. The most up-to-date information indicates that there are at least one of their boxes installed in 14 states. The next handout, celebrate the lives of three babies that were saved through the Safe Haven Baby Boxes at fire stations in Alabama and Missouri just this year. Now, with my remaining time, I just, well, I think I'll, I'll stop there and get back on the mic to talk about the difference between abandonment and surrender. For now, thank you, Mr. President. I yield the remainder of my time to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Holcroft. As the clerk has stated, there is a committee amendment. Senator Wayne, you're recognized to open. Thank you, Mr. President. This is gonna be somewhat unusual. Uh, it's unusual because the amendment was worked on by the vice chair in this committee. Uh, and when I got the amendment, I'll be full transparency, it was the day of. Uh, and so I was a no on the amendment. So I'm gonna yield the rest of my time to the vice chair to explain the amendment because she worked on the amendment. Thank you, Madam, Mr. President. Senator DeBoer yielded 920. Thank you, Mr. President. I uh, wanted to work on some aspects of this bill that I was concerned about. Uh, I want to thank Senator Holcroft, who was willing to work on them with me. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services also uh, provided most of the work for this as well. Uh, it does a number of things, uh, allowing, uh, for example, that if a child is abandoned in one of these uh, safe haven 
situations, it's not considered legal abandonment. Uh, some of the ramifications for that would be the effects on other children in the home. So if someone abandons a child, uh, that opens up a DHHS investigation. The green copy of the bill had provided for the criminal, uh, the lack or the ability to keep criminal liability off, but it did not uh, address the issue of DHHS uh, looking into the situation and uh, possibly child protective services. So there were a number of, of uh, other things um, that are sort of minutia things like how to provide this birth certificate, um, making sure that we uh, indicate that the juvenile court has jurisdiction over the children that have been uh, been given up in this way. Uh, so I wasn't really prepared, sorry, uh, but there are a number of protections in here. Worked on this with DHHS to make sure that there is a basically a mechanism around this process so that uh, in addition to the ones that Senator Holcroft had in his green copy, there are sort of a, a full range of mechanisms and procedures around this uh, process for turning over a child to make sure that um, there's no civil liability or DHHS, uh, Child Protection Services, that there are uh, mechanisms for generating a birth certificate, that there are mechanisms for um, the court to take jurisdiction over the child, that there are ways for the uh, potential fathers to have some ability to be found and notified. Um, some of those things are included in Senator Holcroft's uh, green copy, but then additionally sort of fleshed out completely in the DHHS, uh, which is the committee amendment. So I appreciate Senator Holcroft's working with me on this to provide for uh, all the kind of dotted I's and cross T's on the issues of Child Protective Services and uh, jurisdiction over the infant. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator DeBoer. Senator Ripi, you recognize. Oop. Senator Ripi, hold, please. Mr. Clerk, please. Thank you, Mr. President. I do have a priority motion. Senator Blood would move to bracket the bill until April 11th. Yeah. Senator Blood, you recognize to open. Thank you, Mr. President. Fellow Senators, friends all, I stand opposed as written to LB 876. And I disagree with this, what the speaker said this morning. I believe when people actually listen to debate and they listen to facts, that they quite often will change their votes. And I do know that many of you co-sponsored on this, but I ask you to listen to the facts and data that I'm sharing with you this morning and to take it into consideration. And I do propose a solution to making this bill whole so it can move forward when we are all done with this discussion. So as you may know, safe haven laws were originally adopted with the purpose of reducing infant abandonment and infant homicide. They were not adopted to replace abortions or to be used as an alternative for women who cannot access abortion. Data shows women who are unable to get an abortion rarely use safe havens or give their child up for adoption. Safe havens are really part of a bigger picture about choices for women and reproductive justice. Organizations against baby boxes adoptee rights include, excuse me, organizations against baby boxes include Adoptee Rights Law Center, Bastard Nation, National Safe Haven Alliance, Florida a Safe Haven for Newborns, Broward County Medical Association, Florida Adoption Council, Florida PTA, and Illinois Chicago Bar Association, Illinois DFCS, 
Save Abandoned Babies Foundation, and Indiana, Indiana DCS, Maine, ACLU, Missouri, Missouri Open, New York, New York Adoptee Rights Coalition, Oklahoma, Equal Rights Oklahoma, Oklahoma Original Birth Certificates for All Adult, adult Adoptees, Texas, Abrazo Adoption Association, Texas Adoptee Rights Coalition. These are just a few of the organizations that are against the baby boxes. If you look at legitimate safe haven nonprofits, they are against these baby boxes, and I'm going to explain the details as to why, except it's very loud on this floor right now, so I'm not sure you'll be able to hear me. The United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child decided that haven boxes only encourage parents to give away babies. They argued that male relatives or pimps could easily abandon the children against their mother's wishes. The committee was advocating for a complete ban on the practice. Safe haven groups against these boxes have argued that the boxes don't meet public building safety standards. They can allow someone who kidnapped or trafficked a child. It's about the children, right? I hope you guys are listening. I see a lot of people that are not on the floor. Please listen to this. Don't vote for this bill because it has the word baby in it, because these are not safe for babies. They can easily allow someone who kidnapped or trafficked a child to escape the detection. Parents who have neglected or abused a newborn could also get away with it. Additionally, the boxes give terrorists an easily accessed spot to place a bomb or toxic substance that could endanger hospital workers or firefighters. And I want you to know that I did look at this bill two years ago, and after investigating it, I decided that this was a bad idea. And I had not planned on standing up against this bill until the person who invented the bill and created this nonprofit that charges you $15,000 per box did a TikTok video of which I handed out the other day. If you were to look at this video, you would think that this woman perhaps might want to see a licensed mental health professional because she was off the rails. That last picture might look like I took it and expanded her collagen-filled lips, but that was the last part of the TikTok where she literally was crying out my name with her mouth smushed against the camera. Not very professional, friends. So I want you to know that it doesn't matter that there's no mandates that we're forcing people to put these boxes in. We're opening the doors for these grifters to come into Nebraska. The manufacturers of these baby boxes, by the way, also make pig troughs. In fact, they have a unit that is almost a spitting image of the safe haven box but it costs around $600. These baby boxes start at $15,000 with a $500 a year fee. And we have zero idea when it comes to the shelf life or the kindling point if there were an emergency with the electricity. These boxes are not inspected or approved by organizations like the FDA, American Society of Testing and Materials, CPSC, nor is it approved by the Underwriters Lab. If you look at the videos of these boxes, it's unlikely they would pass inspection as a legitimately safe product. Friends, they look like a pizza box, a pizza oven on one side, and the other side is basically clear plastic. Please look at the video and you'll see what I'm talking about. We, after much research, found out that the T-handle found on the outside of the box can be found at Home Depot. It's a handle designed for garage doors. The hinges used for things like kitchen cabinets. We have access to a letter. I really hope you guys are listening because there's so much noise. I know Senator Reapy is. Thank you, Senator Reapy and Senator DeBoer and Michaela. Oh, excuse me, Kavanaugh, Senator Fredrickson. We have access to a letter from the Fannenberg Corporation. They have requested that Safe Haven Baby Box Group stop using their commercial industrial heater inside the baby boxes. However, the boxes are still being sold with those very heaters. But they likely will never have an official recall because it's never been certified not certified by any nationally recognized text testing lab. These boxes have never passed an NRTL certification, not ever. 
If you look at the FAQ on their website, it says on item one from the nonprofit that at every single stage of design, development, and deployment, the box undergoes stringent testing. And then it contradicts itself. And it says, while no standards exist, the Safe Haven Baby Box Organization is developing standards by adopting the most stringent requirements. In other words, they're testing themselves by not testing themselves. Buyer beware. They say since it's not a medical device, no FDA um, needs to be utilized and it's not available for sale to the public, so no CSPC regulation needs to be done, which is why, by the way, they started the nonprofit so they could avoid all of these uh, all of this oversight. The FAQ goes on to say that it is UL approval, oh, that UL approval is not legally required. To all the electricians, the union electricians watching this today, I'm telling you, you wouldn't put a lamp in your home that isn't UL inspected, but you're going to put a baby in a box that looks like a pizza oven in something that is not UL inspected but it's about the babies. So who is this nonprofit associated with? If you saw your handouts from two days ago, you saw screenshots of the person, which we just talked about, who runs this nonprofit. She and her husband invented the boxes. If you look at the 2022 wages for this nonprofit, you'll note that Monica Kelsey was paid $96,718, and her husband, $74,947,000. Seems pretty lucrative for this couple. Not very charitable, but lucrative. So let's talk about this TikTok post by Monica a little bit further that I really want you to possibly view. I know that we're avoiding TikTok because of the China issue, but if you have somebody who has it on their phone, I encourage you to look at it because this woman is off the rails. When anybody opposes her, and apparently somebody from our exec session passed that information on to her because within 24 hours there was a TikTok up. So thank you. I would not have known it existed again had not all of the legitimate organizations One minute. that are safe haven organizations had contacted me to let me know that it was up there and who this woman really was. I'm going to talk more about the legalities that are involved and some of the major national organizations that are against these boxes and why. I really, truly hope, even though I talked very quickly, that you paid attention to all the dangerous issues that are involved with these baby boxes. But then we're going to start talking about some of the legal issues, and I think you're going to be appalled. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Blood. Senator Reby, you're recognized to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'd like to start off by asking a question of Senator Blood, if she'll take a question. Senator Blood, would you yield a question? Absolutely. Uh, my question is this. I think you stated that the cost was $15,000 per box. Mm -hmm. I read somewhere that it was 15000 per box per year. I don't believe so. Our information shows $15,000 per box and then $500 or more per year. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Um, Mr. Brooks. Ms. President, I'd also uh, like to ask Senator Holcroft if he would take a couple of questions. Senator Holcroft, will you yield a question? Yes, I will. Thank you, Senator Holcroft. Uh, my first question would be is, do we have a frequency of occurrences in Nebraska? Yes, I think I mentioned that in my opening. Did we you? had... Um, uh, let me see here. Actually, I have uh, the history over the last, uh, since 2008. Now, last year, there were two um, babies that were surrendered using the Safe Haven Act, which currently is only hospitals face-to-face. -face. Uh, and there were six um, uh, abandoned children. In other words, children that were not uh, did not use the, the uh, Safe Haven Act. So there they're open to uh, prosecution. Over the, since 2008, I think is what I, I had in my opening, we have, uh, we have had about 200 uh, babies that were abandoned. Only 14 of them uh, were uh, surrendered 
um, under the Safe Haven Act. Uh, and so that's, that's really the purpose of the bill. It's expanding the number of surrender points and also uh, incorporates this uh, uh, safety device, baby, safe haven baby device. Okay, following along on that, uh, my next question would be, how many boxes are proposed for Nebraska and is there a distribution plan? No, I mean, this is totally voluntary. Uh, there's no mandate uh, that the hospitals, they, they can only be installed in hospitals and at fire stations. Okay. Uh, and uh, we are not providing any funding for it. We're looking for the local communities to raise the funds to buy the, uh, and we've had a number of organizations who've expressed an interest in doing that. Okay, thank you. That answers another one of my questions. Will those local communities also be accountable for servicing the boxes? Yes, that will okay. be their responsibility. We are not providing any funding for that uh, from the state. Okay. Uh, another question I have, if you'd be kind enough, was what happens in a power outage, if you will? I assume they they have power there because they have to have alerts and warmth and cooling and... Yes, well, the only requirement in the bill is that the box be padded uh, and climate controlled and have an alarm system. That's the only requirement. Um, there is There are a couple of different companies that provide these uh, devices uh, I, we gave a handout on the one there. I am not sure about its power backup, but that's part of the reason that we, 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 we restricted them to hospitals and to fire stations, which typically have some kind of a backup power system. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I guess my question was too is, who services these boxes? I know that's local accountability, but there's probably some technical knowledge because there's potential liability if the box isn't functioning properly and certified in some way. Yes, yeah, so that goes back to uh, the locations. These are One only minute. Be, thank you, Mr. President. Um, they, only, they only be can be installed at hospitals and at fire stations. We did have uh, uh, both the hospital association and the fire chiefs uh, were, um, I take that back, the fire chiefs testified in uh, as proponents of this bill. Hospitals, I have to go back and check, uh, and I have an amendment that's coming up uh, that satisfies some of their concerns. Okay. If, the, um, if the local communities are accountable for this, then there's no real fiscal note for the state in this? There is a fiscal note, it's about $80,000. There's $15,000 $15, to establish the website and to provide grants if communities come forward to help them with the installation. Uh, and then there is uh, $65,000 for training for, um, for 911 operators, for, uh, for EMS personnel, fire station personnel. Time. Thank you, Senator Reby, Senator Blatt, and Senator Holcroft. Senator Von Gilleran would like to introduce, uh, recognize his wife, Mary Von Gilleran out of Omaha, Nebraska. She is uh, located on the, the North Balcony. Please stand and be recognized by your Nebraska State Legislature. Senator Raybould, you're recognized to speak. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, colleagues. I would like to yield the balance of my time to Senator Blood. Senator Blood, you're yielded 450. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Raybould. So as you heard, we are providing funds because we will be promoting these boxes. These boxes that have no safety precautions, these boxes that are making individuals wealthy, and some people might even think that these people are grifters based on the thing, information that we're gonna be sharing with you. We're gonna be providing grants for boxes, so although not buying the boxes, we're providing people the means to get the boxes, training and a website. So we're promoting the scam with state tax dollars. I wanna address Bastard Nation, and although I'm not like thrilled with the name of their organization, it is, an adoptee rights organization, and it is the largest adoptee rights civil rights organization in the United States. And they have come out strong against these baby boxes. 
because adoptee rights and adoption reform organizations throughout the United States oppose deceptive re relinquishment practices that are rooted in shame and secrecy that lead to drastic permanent solutions to temporary problems and create a population of adopted people who have given birth but have no birth records, identity, or history. We seek ethics, transparency, and accountability in adoption and in related child welfare, welfare practices, not band-aid and gimmick solutions to social, political, and mental health problems that cause newborn discards. Sorry, Senator Erdman, I have to use my, my outdoor voice. It's loud behind me. Con contrary to long-standing and established child welfare policies, the use of baby boxes, sometimes called newborn safety devices, creates a secretive and shadow child welfare system that eliminates informed consent. A child's identifying information in any record of the social and medical history of newborns. Baby boxes operate to eliminate a child's right to identity by eliminating accurate birth registrations and records. It commodifies infants and normalizes legal baby abandonment as a consumer choice without acknowledging the lifetime psych psychological consequences for the baby and the mother, including but not limited to abandonment issues, shame, guilt, substance abuse, depression, low self-esteem, and suicidal ideology. Boxes represent state-promoted throwaway culture. Some critics call them instruments of child abuse. It replaces professional best practice standards with unprofessional and unethical relinqu relinquishment procedures. Baby boxes instead give vulnerable parents a right to abandon an infant out of convenience or ignorance with no counseling, documentation, or discussion of established alternatives such as adequate medical care, financial and material family preservation assistance or crisis nurseries. It deprives the non-surrounding centering parent of the right to hear excuse me, <clears throat> of the right to rear her, her or his own child. Baby boxes eliminate any protections to, to prove that a person using the box has a legal right to surrender the baby. Embarrassed, frightened, or abusive partners, spouses, or family members, and even sex traffickers will use and undoubtedly have used baby boxes without the consent or knowledge of the other parent with no repercussions. Baby box proponents dismiss the real dangerous and violent situations experienced by women simply advocating that if your baby is taken, just call the police. It disenfranchises natural parents, particularly the non-surrendering parent, usually the father, of their right to due process by eliminating their ability to One locate minute. the child, thus denying them knowledge of the dependency proceedings to which they are a party. State-based putative Putative father registries touted as a safeguard are rendered useless since records are filed by the name of the mother who remains anonymous by law. I would yield that time I have left over as I'm in the queue to talk again. Thank you, Senator Blood. Colleagues, as mentioned earlier today, we're going to pause debate at this point because we have the honor of welcoming back to the chamber today some former members of the legislature. I will announce each senator by name in the order of the list I was provided along with their years of service and the district each person represented. I would ask each former legislator to come to the front of the chamber when I announce their name. Beginning with District 36, Senator Matt Williams, who served from 2015 to 2023. <laughs> District 24, Senator Mark Coulterman, 2015 to 2023. <laughs> District 28, Senator Patty Panzing Brooks from 2015 to 2023. <laughs> District 41, Senator Sa Kate Sullivan from 2009 to 2017. <laughs> District 35, Senator Mike Glor from 2009 to 2017. <laughs> District 23, Senator Jerry Johnson from 2013 to 2017. <laughs> District 33, Senator Les Seiler from 2013 to 2017. District 24, Senator Greg Adams from 2007 
to 2015. <laughs> District 6, Senator John Nelson from 2007 to 2015. <laughs> District 38, Senator Tom Carlson from 2007 to 2015. <laughs> District 2, Senator Dave Pankinen from 2007 to 2011. <laughs> District 27, Senator Diana Shimmick from 1989 to 2009. <laughs> District 26, Senator Marion Price, 1999 to 2007. District 36, Senator Jim Cutterback, 1991 to 2007. <laughs> District 38, Senator Ed Schrock, 1990 to 1993 and 1995 to 2007. <laughs> District 10, Senator Carol McBride Persh, 1979 to 1997. <laughs> District 22, Senator Lee Rupp, 1983 to 1998. <laughs> and District 41, Senator Vicki McDonald, 2001 to 2009. Welcome, Senators.
Colleagues, please join me in a final appreciation for our former members and their years of public service to the state of Nebraska. Mr. Clerk, for a motion. Mr. President, priority motion, Senate. Excuse me, we have one item to be read across. Committee on Urban Affairs reports Legislative Bill 947 to general file with committee amendments. Now a priority motion, Senator Ben Hansen to move to recess until 1.30. Colleagues, you've heard the motion. All those in favor say aye. All those opposed nay. We are in recess. <laughs>